Remember how the Tolkien Society held that seminar a few weeks ago that was pure woke madness? Remember how I said they live-streamed the seminar? Well, they didn't. I think that's because news of the seminar spread, and most people's reaction was pretty negative. I think that reaction of the impending cringe fest led the Tolkien Society to nix the idea of broadcasting the seminar live on YouTube. They haven't even put the recorded sessions on their YouTube channel yet, although that may change. I doubt it because it'd only draw more negative attention once people see what the papers were actually about. We do get a glimpse of that. The Tolkien Society updated their seminar webpage with descriptions of the papers, and if you thought the titles were bad, well, buckle up, buckaroo, because the descriptions are things of special magnificence. I'm sure they posted these to show people that they were outraged about nothing. If so, they fail. Let me just give you the first one. Gondor in Transition, a brief introduction to transgender realities in The Lord of the Rings by Cordelia Logsdon. Quote, Using Gondor as the basis for closer examination, this paper outlines the presence and function of transgender realities in Tolkien's work in ways the privileged reading of the text ignores or dismisses. I think that was English. I'm not entirely sure, but I think it was. What transgender realities? Where? There are no transgender people in Middle-earth and damn sure none in Gondor. Where are you getting this from? Most specifically, Denethor, Pindulius of Dol Amra, the ruling stewardship of Gondor as a concept, and the trajectory and timeline of Gondor's development are examined. Can I get a translator? Because I don't speak Wakandan. Neither Denethor or Fendulius are transgender, and there is nothing trans about being a steward instead of a king or how a kingdom develops. Jesus Christ, you're reaching with all six Centauri dicks and you still ain't touching a thing. There is no way of reading anything Tolkien wrote that would make that claim make sense. You're taking two characters and just twisting them to suit your theory instead of paying attention to the text, or as Cordelia claims, quote, In the process, this paper demonstrates the way reading against the grain provides a crucial expansion of the way both fans and academics currently engage with and think about Tolkien's work. By ignoring what he wrote and just making up your own story with his characters. Because that's all you're doing. If you want to talk about this stuff, you're welcome to do it, but why are you trying to force Tolkien's work into that discussion when it has nothing to do with what you're talking about? Now, keep in mind, this is what Cordelia had to send to the Tolkien Society to get the paper approved. So they read that this person was going to ignore the actual text and just make shit up because she wanted to talk about trans issues, and they went, let's do that. Brilliant. And that's what happens with half these papers. Some of the papers just have ridiculous titles, but the descriptions sound reasonable and interesting. That kind of thing usually happens when people let their desire to sound sophisticated get in the way of their actual point. If you want to talk about Tolkien's use of injuries in his story and how they affect the characters who suffer from them, just say that. If you want to talk about how Elrond felt living after the fallout of the end of the Second Age, just say that. You don't need to get cute. Then you have papers like Pardoning Saruman, the queer in Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings by Christopher Vaccaro. Yes, the title is insane, but the description is worse because it has nothing at all to do with Saruman. The paper is actually about Manwe, the leader of the Vala, and it's not about his relationship with Saruman, but instead compares him to an African-Brazilian god to, quote, show that the archetypes are not reserved to myths, dreams, arts, and old religions. Instead, it still lives in our daily lives, especially in religion, even though we cannot see it sometimes. What does this have to do with Saruman, or queering him, as you say in the title? let alone what Tolkien actually wrote. There are a couple other papers like this, like Sarah Brown's The Invisible Other, Tolkien's Dwarf Women and the Feminine Lack, and Sonali Chunakar's Desire of the Ring, an Indian academic's adventures in her quest for the perilous realm, which are really about an entirely different topic and are just using Tolkien to talk about it. Vaccaro wants to talk about Brazilian folklore and mythology, Brown wants to talk about feminism, and Chunakar wants to talk about how Europeans can't be brown-skinned. Someone tell Dan Bongino. And it results in dumb arguments like Brown whining about dwarf women being, quote, unable to construct their own identity other than that of not being male. The only distinctiveness offered to Tolkien's dwarf women is fashioned through simple biology. They are female and may bear children, hence being called women. They can't construct their own identity. One, they're dwarves, so they already have an identity. As dwarves, it's not like they'd be that different from their male counterparts. If they were, Tolkien would have mentioned it. Two, they're fictional characters, so they don't construct their own identity, the writer does that for them. Or this Jim from Chunatkar, quote, While popularizing Tolkien's works among English-language Indian readers, Jackson's films nonetheless cemented the image of Tolkien as a British-English writer who wrote only about white people. 
I will instead emphasize the need to unlearn such received imagination so that we can all appreciate Tolkien's radical description and the implications of Sam with his brown hands being elected the mayor of the Shire that is peopled by the browner-skinned Harfoots, who are the most normal and representative variety of Hobbit and far the most numerous. For the love of... You know there are white people with brown skin, right? Every white person isn't pale as snow. Some white people have darker skin. Look at Sicilians. Look at Spaniards. Instead of assuming brown means not European, we should find out what Tolkien meant by brown. What exactly was he describing? This is the most basic thing to do instead of trying to prove that the races of Middle Earth weren't inspired by European ethnic groups. But when the agenda is all that matters, you end up with this kind of nonsense. I'm sure these people mean what they say and probably believe it, but does it really have a place in discussions about Tolkien's work when they're undermining or ignoring what the man told us he did? People asked him these questions when he was alive, and he answered most of them. Why are you trying to say he intended something he didn't, or was inspired by something he wasn't, or trying to erase what did influence him because it doesn't fit your narrative? This is the type of thing that pisses off fans, and this is why we get papers like Stars Less Strange, an analysis of fan fiction and representation within the Tolkien fan community by Don Walls Thuma. In the paper, she argues for so-called reparative reading, which is basically people coming in and changing the Lord of Suit to politics and worldview. Quote, while poor representation of diverse groups is endemic in literary and media texts, Tolkien's works are often singled out for their problematic representation of gender and race, and silence and sexuality, making his canon fruitful territory for transformative works by fans that not only recognize the existence of women, people of color, and queer characters within Middle-earth, but transform the canon to recast Tolkien's stories from their perspectives. Listen, you don't get to change the man's work. He already wrote it to be applicable. All you have to do is find a character or a situation you like and treat it as a metaphor for your own experience. You don't get to change his story, his world, or his characters to appeal to a bunch of self-absorbed snowbodies to quote, correct racism, sexism, and homophobia found within Tolkien's canon. I have a question though. If you find Tolkien's work so bigoted that you need to fundamentally change it from what it is, why are you a fan of it? Here's this thing that you claim you like. So you're going to change it so that it's nothing like what it originally was. That makes zero sense. But that's not the one you're here for. The one you're all waiting for is something mighty queer. Destabilizing cis-hetero amatonormativity in the works of Tolkien by Dana Peterson Deep Rose. And yes, it is a clusterfuck of wokeism. Just have a taste. Quote, my project draws from intersectional feminism and postmodern queer theories, as well as recent Tolkien scholarship to examine how Tolkien's depictions of characters, relationships, and ways of loving and existing destabilize contemporary cis hetero amatonormative structures. While I offer a queer reading, I do not focus on eroticism or romance. Rather, I look at how various characters, relationships, and races complicate essentialist understandings of gender and cis heteronormativity. Did you catch all of that? Because I read it and I still don't understand what the fuck I just said. It's just 4D old word salad from Cunty Buffet. Who thought this was a good idea? Who at the Tolkien Society thought this made sense? This is just nonsense. I've heard gibberish magic spells rattled off on third-rate TV shows that make more sense. Here's another volley, though. Quote, Non-heterosexual partnerships and non-traditional gender presentation are extremely common in Middle-earth. No, they're not. There are no gay characters at all. The men and women have very traditional roles, and all the family situations you see were common in the medieval period, and all of this appears in the folktales that inspired Tolkien. It continues, quote, Next, I examine how certain individual character traits and race-defining attributes challenge essentialist ideas about gender. I focus on the representation of dwarves, universally bearded and masculine body, elves, virtually all smooth-cheeked with long flowing hair, the Ainur, who choose a body to match their innate temper, and humans and hobbits, zeroing in on Eowyn and Mary. If you pull any more straws, the Midwest will turn into a fucking dust bowl. You're ignoring the context for so many things, like Ole, who created the dwarves in his own image, being bearded, or that the Ainur actually have a sex associated with their spirit, being either male or female in nature, but can take on whatever shape they want. You don't just get to make shit up, like this, quote, Finally, I examine the complicated relationship between queerness and virtue and art. The books repeatedly reinforce traditional gender roles. But you just said that they didn't. How do you speak out of both sides of your mouth without all the bullshit just tumbling out? But are simultaneously inhabited by diverse races that embody gender in a multitude of ways. And though Sauron's feminized behavior... Wait, what, what, the, what the fuck are you talking about? Look at the screen. 
Look at the fucking screen. This is a shit on the site. I'm not making it up. It's on the site. What feminized behavior? Sauron's over here fucking with men's minds and trying to conquer the world and making everyone bow down to his whim. Oh, never mind. And non-normative relationships threaten Middle Earth at large. It is Frodo and Sam's intimate queer relationship that literally saves the world. Frodo and Sam aren't gay. I already did a video about this shit. Stop it. They're friends. Stop calling them gay. They're not gay. They're just friends. This is the bullshit the Tolkien Society hosted. Just people making up wild nonsense that has fuck all to do with Tolkien or his stories. Why you would do this, I don't understand. It benefits nobody, and apparently y'all were so afraid of the negative response that you didn't even live stream the event and you're basically trying to hand wave this away. And my favorite part is that when people brought this up to them on Twitter, the person running the account said that it wasn't the Tolkien Society's purpose to safeguard Tolkien's works. Don't worry, I'll give you a moment to pick your jaw up off the floor. You call yourselves the Tolkien Society, but you're not concerned with upholding Tolkien's works. When did the Tolkien Society abandon reason for madness? Much like with Gondor, it appears that the rule over the Tolkien Society was given over to lesser men. But what do I know? I'm just some guy.